What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to NBA Award Week. I know this is a little bit confusing to you because the title has nothing to do with awards, but you know what I just figured out? You know, for the last two days of me doing these awards, what I found out was majority of people don't care about awards nearly as much as I do. And that was actually a surprise. And I'm talking about through the statistics of how many people are watching this compared to a normal video versus what the comment section is saying. I'm low-key maybe impressed that y'all not that much of psychos like me and some of the other homies. I mean, well, there are the people uh, that once you snub one of their favorite players, they're at your mentions or in the comment section. That's completely understandable. But I just, I mean, overall, we dropped the video on Defensive Player of the Year. We dropped the video on Rookie of the Year. And people are like, oh, okay, cool. And I just expect I just expected a little bit more. I'm I'm not mad, you know what I'm saying? I'm not upset at all. I'm just coming into a realization. Okay, so we we are back with another episode in these this award week, and today we're talking about Coach of the Year. Right, Coach of the Year is always an interesting one because sometimes it defaults to who is the who is the coach of the best team in the NBA, and sometimes it defaults to who is the team that overachieved more than anything. And last year was Tom Thibodeau with the New York Knicks, and that makes sense to me. He got my vote because the Knicks were not expected to be a playoff team, and there they were in the playoffs comfortably. This year, I'm getting straight to the winner. For me, Monty Williams is my Coach of the Year, but there are a lot of other coaches out there that deserves some recognition that I, if this person won it, I wouldn't be upset. But I just, I feel like this is, gonna, I'm going to sound like Devin Booker right now. Uh, if we don't give Monty Williams this award, it feels like we're moving the goalposts, right? Because even though the Suns just left the finals last season, they even exceeded all of the expectations for all of us. I went back and we're going to we're gonna look through some of these articles, but I went back and, and just went through a different different articles, whether it be Bleach Report, whether it be this public ESPN or all the other publications where people are trying to predict the records of teams. And a lot of people expected the Phoenix Suns to be a 50 win team now i know that is crazy to say aloud right now because this team has exceeded that dramatically and nobody's even bad at night but a lot of people expected this team to be like a 50 win team coming off them coming out of the championship which is wild and here they are exceeding that above and beyond with their top three players playing minutes together for sure but only playing like 20-ish 30 games together this entire season i think monty williams deserves it he should be running away with it but there are some other teams out there. Like, if you want to tell me that Eric Spolster deserved to win Coach of the Year, I can't even be mad at you. He is in a similar situation than, than um, the Monty Williams in the sense that his top three players, Kyle Lowry, Bam Adebayo, and, and Jimmy Butler, missed a significant amount of time, and he was finding people like Max Struess. He was finding people like, um, who, who else? Uh, Caleb Martin to come out of nowhere and give them super quality minutes. That's good coaching. If you wanted to tell me it was Ime Udoka, I think he has the most unique case of them all from a guy that seemed like he was on the hot seat if you asked their fans a month and a half into the season to a dude that has solidified himself as like one of the better defensive coaches in the league. And the second half jump that they had, I think he should be in some consideration. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't as smooth. He went through obstacles. He, he went over speed bumps. He went through all of that. If you wanted to put J.B. Bickerstaff in a conversation, I understand now the case of J.B. Bickerstaff is getting worse and worse every day. It's not a fault of his own because he can't keep his team healthy but the fact that this team came team came into the scene and at one point they were one of the top three seeds in the entire conference when they were healthy I think he deserves some consideration if you wanted to say Taylor Jenkins was your guy man this team is 20 and 2 when John Morant hasn't played that's 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 a testament to great team building great chemistry in the locker room and great coaching I can't be mad at those but Monty it's still my guy. So like I said, in preparation for this video, I went back to look at some of the other predictions that we saw. So I decided to pull up one from Leach Report, from Andy Bailey. I do want to go out on a limb and say this is not us making fun of Andy Bailey or anybody that made predictions because predictions are hard to make. Um, we're going to be wrong on predictions like 80% of the time because the NBA and sports in general are just such an unpredictable thing. And that's why we watch it. If, if we could accurately predict every single thing, you wouldn't watch the, you wouldn't watch the thing. Every NBA team's win-loss prediction after the, the schedule release. Of course, Andy Bailey put it together. Shout out to him. And LeBron and Giannis are on the thing. So I don't know if they was trying to say that LeBron and Giannis are going to be winning their conferences. But as it sits right now, if that was your prediction, that's both wrong at the moment. The Bucks still have a chance, but it's wrong at the, this exact moment. All right, here we go. In the Atlantic Division, people predicted that the Brooklyn Nets were going to win 54 games. Wow. Now this video has turned into a, like a retrospective of the entire season because, well, this felt like an acceptable thing because nowhere in the world did we, we really think about um, James Harden decided that he did not want to play for the team or the fact that there was going to be a mandate that predicted Kyrie Irving for playing for 60% of the season. And here we are uh, with them 
projected to be the number one team in their division for them to be a play-in team locked in in the play-in team right now is, is such a weird thing the 76 prediction is almost spot on right now they have 49 wins with a couple games left of the season so they're probably going to end up at 50 and maybe 51 which is it's a very very good prediction but it's almost it's, it's such a great testament to this guy right here and his ability to maintain greatness and in the face of a lot of locker room stuff ben simmons was a was a big distraction the story of ben simmons was a big distraction this entire season Joel and B said, I don't really care. I'm going to go out there and be in conversation for MVP. Then eventually they make the big trade, and they've been they've been good since the trade, before the trade. All of that is true. Next, we got the Boston Celtics, who at this point have exceeded these expectations. Woo, woo, woo. Shout out to Boston Celtics Nation. Green, Green Nation? Celtic Nation? Celtic Nation sounds about right. Celtic Nation. The Knicks was projected to be 10 games over 500, and boy, them boys failed. They are about 10 games under 500. And actually, right before I start here recording this video, they blew a game to the New York. Oh, nope, not the New York anymore. Nope, nope, not New York. The Brooklyn New York Nets. And that was a very great comeback by the Nets because they needed that one to not they haven't secured anything but that loss with the Atlanta Hawks win could have put the Brooklyn Nets on the bottom two of the play which means they'd have to win two games to qualify instead of just one so that's a big win with a couple games left for the season the Toronto Raptors exceeded all expectations projected to win 34 games and they went out there and won over 46 shout out to them a lot of that has to do with that young boy that ain't even here because they didn't even expect the young boy out there to do his thing you tell that I'm team uh Scotty Barnes on a lot of different things Milwaukee Bucks this is um a little bit less this is a little bit more than what they actually won but Rick Lopez going out was injured very early on and then went some championship fatigue this team didn't have their foot on the gas the entire season so I'm, I, I don't mind them being a couple games off because you know what I'm saying that felt like the right prediction they expected the Bulls to be a, a 47 win team which is actually higher than I feel like most people had the Bulls I think when I turn on the TV a lot of people on uh, TV or, or read articles listen to podcasts a lot of people are like oh the, what the Bulls did was cool and all bringing the Martin Rosen in and boom, boom boom but like this is probably a team that's gonna be a 500 team and guess what we're a little bit better than that. We're a little bit better than that. All of our events that say that we're a 500 team, um, but DeMar DeRozan has taken over so many fourth quarters that he's got us 10 games over 500. Uh, so, yeah, shout out to the Bulls. Playoff secure. You feel me? Who we go against in that first round? Might have a, a cakewalk, but playoffs secured. I'm actually so very invested in the fact that the Bulls are about to make history. Or I guess they did make history today. And you know what? I didn't fact check. This is something that Stat Muse probably would have tweeted. Um, to be a six seed, but also have just one win against the top eight teams in the league has to be a statistic that has never happened in the history of basketball. And oh, you know what? I'll take that back. It might have happened because sometimes conferences are so bad that a seven seed, six seed could be like a, a below 500 team. How about a team that was 10 games over 500 and had one win versus the top eight teams in the league? That has to be a statistical anomaly. And as much as I hate it as a Bulls fan, I'm low-key impressed. I had how, how oh, let's keep the F-bombs down. And how bad this team is against good teams. Because it's not just like, oh man, we almost got them this time. Boys are getting spanked. They don't even come to play against good teams. We like the average margin of loss against these good teams is like 15 points. I ain't been in one game against a good team other than early Celtics, which don't even count because it was early Celtics, where I felt confident that we might have a chance. The, the best it got is like earlier in the season when we thought that the Lakers were good and we beat them two times. We're like, oh, oh, and then we found out that the Lakers are a bad team. So those wins mean nothing. The Pacers were projected to be a playoff team, but then things went bad. I remember early in the season, um, the Pacers beat the Bulls and they beat them bad. They beat them by like 30. And then Pacers fans were in the mentions like, aha, Kenny, yeah, like giving me Fortnite dance um, gifts and stuff. And it was because a couple of days before that, I had tweeted something like the Pacers are bogus because they blew like a 15 point lead to like a bad team. And, and it was in the moment tweet that said the Pacers are bogus because in that moment they were bogus. If you blow on a 15 point lead to a bad team, you're bogus, right? And then, oh, the Pacers fans came at me. Ah, oh, Kenny, who bogus now? And I'm good with some good old smack talk. But what did I reply? Y'all going to be rebuilding soon. And guess what y'all doing? <laughs> you feel me? Poke the bell. I really enjoy your rebuild so far, though. Tyrese is the homie. I can't, I'm going to drive to Indiana next season to watch Tyrese play a couple games. Or, since y'all in the same division, I can just go to the UC. The Cavaliers were expected to win 25 games. 25. 
five. Right now, they're at 43. They have almost got 20 more wins that they are projected on the season. That is an insane amount. Development isn't always linear, but it's probably safe to expect some improvement from Colin Sexton, Darius Garland. That's understated because Darius Garland turned into a, a, a demigod. And, and Isaac Okoro, with the addition of Evan Moby, that sounds like a recipe for a notable team improvement, too. However, several organizations in the Eastern Conference took dramatic steps forward, and they just didn't expect the Cavs to do anything. This, a hey, J.B. Bickerstaff, you might win coach of the year, my boy, to be 20 games over what you were projected to win. They got the Detroit Pins at 23, and they have 23 exactly with two games left of the season. And the Cade actually played today. I was going to say they're not playing nobody, but the Cade played today. Moving on to the Western Conference, the Jazz were projected to win 73. They're about five games over that. I don't have any anything to say about the Utah Jazz in the moment. The Nuggets were projected to win 49, and they're two games under that with two games to go, so it's a possibility. Portland, big miss. Makes sense, though, with Dame going out with his injury and then them deciding to be like, ah, we're going to reset everything. It makes sense that uh, most people are wrong. I was wrong on this one. Nobody, I don't think many people expected them to to hit a full, uh, a close to full reset by trading CJ and all of that. Minnesota Timberwolves exceed an expectation, expect to be a below 500 team. And, well, they're 10 games over at this moment, moment with two games left. OKC expected... Hold on, OKC was expected to win 17. Boy, they got 24 of them things. Give coach Mark Dayton... Mark... Mark Dolch, Dayton, Mark D, give him close of the year, exceeding the expectations as well. Um, this was the biggest miss, of course. But again, this is not on Andy Bailey. I think majority of us predicted that the Lakers are going to be good. Some of us didn't think they were going to be championship good, but some of us thought they would be good enough to, at the bare minimum, be a playoff team. Um, and they did not exceed in that whatsoever. Uh, with the record of 31 wins on the season right now, it's kind of tough. The Warriors were projected to win 50 games, and with three games left of the season, this is a good prediction, man. That's a very, very good prediction. The Suns, like I said, here it is. The Suns at 50, and they are 13 games over that right now, and they're losing to the Clippers, so a couple games left of the season. I would expect them to rest a little bit um, for these last couple games, but a 63-win team at the moment is insane. Um, there's not a ton of teams in NBA history to do that, to win 63 games. There's not a ton of teams in NBA history to be in the finals the year before then go out there and win 60 games. And most of the teams that have done that went on to win the championship. I think the only one that didn't were the Ma the Mavericks. I was listening to Zach Lowe's podcast just like a week ago and they were talking about this. It might have been the Mavericks the year that they lost to the um to We Believe Warriors. Either way, Clippers at 43 wins. They're a little bit less than that, but I guess they didn't expect Paul George to miss that much time. Paul George will likely have an MVP finalist version of himself. Sure. Kings, 33 wins. You 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 overshot it, my boy. I'm sorry, you overshot it. That's crazy that you still overshot the Kings. Next, we have the Miami Heat. I thought we were done with this conference, but nope. We're back to the Miami Heat, who were projected to win 48, and they have exceeded that. The Atlanta Hawks have disappointed, but you know what? They're playing some of their best basketball at the right time, so it's okay. The Charlotte Hornets are projected to be a slightly above, and that's actually a good prediction with three games left. But then again, the Charlotte Hornets are just so average that maybe maybe they end up at 500 once it's all said and done. The Wizards were expected to be a 500 team. You know what? I was looking at the standings, and I have not watched a lot of Washington Wizards since Bradley Beal went, done, went down. They're, they're a better team than I ex expected them to be after the Bradley Beal injury and, and after the Porzingis trade. You know, something might be brewing over there a little bit. And then we have the Orlando Magic at 17. They got 21. Last division is the Dallas Mavericks at 49 and they ended up having 50 right now with a couple games left of the season shout out to that man that smiling man right there because he's a big portion of this here's another one here's another one at this moment in time this team is 13 games over what they were projected to win and that's still with a couple games left of the season 13 games over projection like i said if taylor jenkins is the guy you have as coach of the year I can't be mad. I'm still having Monty, but I cannot be mad because this is also an insane number right there. Pelicans 42. I think this is before they knew that Zion was going to be out for the entire season. So 42 is actually not that bad of a guess uh, because I feel like if Zion was there, 42, 42 is very gettable. Here go the Spurs. Greg Popovich exceeding expectations, and then the Rockets exceeded. Um, the bottom of the bottoms always exceeded. It looks like they just undervalued. Uh, these teams, 17 wins, 18 wins. A lot of teams didn't do that this season. Everybody had at least 20. Gave the fans at least 20 games worth of basketball to watch and be excited about. So, I don't know. Ramble video a little bit. Going through a little bit of re revisionist history. Uh, Monty Williams is my coach of the year. And that's what this video is really about.